insist every single time that we talk to you not just for the abdomen but for everything else that when you're approaching a problem you cannot afford to miss climbing the clinical ladder and that means you have to take a proper history do a proper full clinical examination including a thorough general survey that's where most people come to grief during exams you read up about you know a number of things you read up about how neutrophils settle wherever but you can't even reach there because you haven't you just skipped your general survey you confirm the diagnosis only after a very very thorough history and a clinical examination and you use appropriate in investigations and then you institute the appropriate treatment so if you remember that this class and appendix started off this young lady 25 years of age who presents with pain which started in the upper abdomen 24 hours ago with nausea presently the pain has shifted to the right lower abdomen the patient is now febrile has not passed stool has intense nausea and vomiting it hurts to move and any strain causes pain her periods are due any day and her last menstrual flow was very insignificant she normally has intense pain during the first two days of her menstruation and this is nothing like that but there's no history of a white discharge this pain is quite different from a usual period pain she has not had any major illnesses in the past and her work involves long hours and an irregular diet and we worked out the examination with the pulse which is slightly tachycardic and she was 110 per minute her blood pressure was 100 by 60 she looked dehydrated she was looked a bit toxic and uh, her general survey was absolutely fine except that she was a bit pale and we saw the pala in the lower conjunctival uh, 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 in the lower conjunctiva in the lips and in the tongue uh, in the nail beds and we confirmed that she was slightly anemic and the rest of the general survey was normal and on examination of the abdomen uh, abdomen mm -hmm. was moving slightly with respiration and on examination we found on palpation we found that she had muscle guard and rigidity over her um, uh, over the right lower abdomen and we discussed what was muscle guard and what was rigidity we decided that muscle guarding was something that was volitional the patient tightened up the muscle to prevent any pain from uh, structures within and rigidity was that the muscle was uh, uh, became uh, became very firm very, very tight as a result of the process that was going on so that being there we promised ourselves that we thought of appendicitis why because of the pain the pain started in the epigastrium shifted down to the right iliac fossa which is characteristic of appendicitis why because appendicitis before it reaches before the inflammation reaches the parietes the pain was all pain is always midline because all GI structures come from the midline. So during the process of distension, the pain was in the epigastrium or around the umbilicus. Now, when the inflammation has spread, it settles down in the right iliac fossa. It, initially, there's some relief of pain because the body pours out the peritoneal fluid, pour, peritoneum pours out a lot of fluid. So you surprisingly, that's the paradox that sometimes the pain seems to go down and then it starts when bacterial peritonitis sets, uh, settles in. So now we have investigations and we've done the investigations. Hemoglobin 12.6, so we were wrong in assessing that she was anemic. Her total leukocyte count was 14,600 with a neutrophil of 85 with a leftward shift. Urea was 67, creatinine was 1.5, amylase 133, lipase 141. Uh, can we have the mics off, please? You know, mute your connections. Sodium 158, potassium 3.4, liver function test was normal, and the ECG was normal, and the chest X-ray was normal. We corroborated at percussion that the liver dullness was present. It was not obliterated. So we have here, we have here a raised total leukocyte count, a neutrophil, which is high, 85%. And the anesthet and the pathologist tells you there's a leftward shift. Now, somebody tell me what is 
a leftward shift. Who can tell me what is a leftward shift? Anyone? What is a leftward shift? No takers? The pathologist says there's a leftward shift. That's a normal. Uh, let me choose that color. Earlier that, stage of the neutrophil, uh, percentage of earlier stage of neutrophil increase. Very good. So you have, this is the neutrophil, which is the nucleus is, has segments, isn't it? Right? So what now happens is when you have a leftward shift, it goes back to its original form, which means you have, what is the next form? What is the next form? What is this form called? It's called the banded form. Okay, banded. So that's the proper neutrophil N. This is the banded form. Then you land up in a situation where you're quite right. It's going back to the towards the marrow. It's a, you know, it's, we, there was a movie called uh, the. Weird life of Benjamin Button, where you know there was this man who was born old and grew and grew younger as the days went on. So from the band forms, it forms a promyelocyte, then becomes a myelocyte, where the nucleus becomes big. And ultimately, a very scary sort of a situation. Hang on, I just need to get this waiting room out. Sorry. Where you land up with something called a myeloblast. And you're always worried when you have a myeloblast, you're worried whether this is a, some sort of a leukemic proceed, process. So the nucleus is very large and very little amount of cytoplasm, right? So that's your myeloblast so it, usually unless the infection is very severe you don't have so uh, the myeloblast coming out but that is a shift to the left so please remember that is what is defined by a shift to the left so basic knowledge so you know you need to know what do you mean by a shift to the left okay now so under that circumstance, you've taken an abdominal x-ray, a chest x-ray in a erect posture. It's absolutely normal. There's no gas under the diaphragm. So what was your next test? What is your next investigation that you would carry out? You might choose to carry out an ultrasound and you'll be incredibly lucky if, you, if the ultrasonologist gives you something like this. 99% ultrasonologist will not be able to pick up an appendicitis. This is one of those unusual appendicitis with a fecal in place and a hugely distended appendix. Remember, this is the exception. It's not the rule, which is why I've put in a red query out here. So what are the things that are more likely to come if you do an ultrasound scan? We are trying to exclude other things. We are trying to exclude, let's say, a right ureteric stone with upstream hydronephrosis formation. We are trying to exclude adnexal lesions. You know, you might have a twisted ovarian cyst. We are trying to exclude some sort of a pathology where there's a chocolate cyst which has ruptured. So we are trying to, it's a process, the ultrasound is a process of exclusion. So a uh, twist, ectopic, ectopic pregnancy also. Ectopic, yeah, I've got the, uh, got the picture. Because this patient, okay. remember, the last pregnancy, last periods was insignificant. And she's due for her periods any time. So twisted vascular pedicle showing the circular string of beads appearance. This is the string of beads appearance. So that's the string of beads. So that's the string of beads. Hang on. Let me use this. That's the string of beads. Multiple beads. So that was described uh, by Dr. Vijay 
Vijay, uh, I think Vijay Raghavan, Vijay Raghavan. So um, that was very interesting because that has been taken up very largely by the ultrasonologist. So this was the urinary bladder. That's the cyst and the pedicle you find that you sometimes see a whirlpool sign, a string of beads sign. So that is something that uh, you might want to see. And, and quite rightly, as Rudrajit pointed out, that the important thing to pick up is an ectopic, don't miss an ectopic pregnancy. See, I mean, you, uh, Dr. Sina actually showed you what is an axial plane what is a sagittal plane? What is a coronal plane? So here, this patient, this patient had a sagittal section out here, which showed a fetal pole and a yolk sac and the uterus very close by. So the ultrasonologist wasn't very sure whether this was pregnancy inside the uterus or not. But if you change it to a coronal section, you notice that you can see the fetal pole and the gestational sac outside and the uterus out here. Now, one of the symptoms that you sometimes these patients present with is you find the flanks dull. You sometimes find a bit of bluish uh, coloring around the flanks also because of the collection of blood. And significantly, one of the other things that the patient will complain of is when the patient lies down, there's shoulder tip pain. Why shoulder tip pain? Because blood trickles down on the diaphragm and you have an irritation because you know the, the undersurface of the diaphragm and the shoulder has the same nerve supply. So you picked up, uh, you, you should never ever miss a ruptured ectopic pregnancy. Thank you, Rudrajit. Now, this is another thing that can be found. The sagittal scanning of the pelvis shows a thickening of the endometrium and a small amount of fluid in the pelvis. And typically, this pain occurs at the middle of the period. It's called middle schmutz. What is this? You have an ovum which ruptures. There's a bit of bleeding around. And you then have pain in the right or the left side. And if it's on the right side, you sometimes get, you know, the parents get worried. This child has just started, the young girl has just started to have a period. They are worried about an appendicitis and bring her in. But believe me, this is a pain that sort of settles down given, you know, within a, a, a day or two. And inevitably, if you take a proper history, this is the important bit. If you take a proper history, she will always complain of a little bit of pain during exactly at the middle of a period. Her periods are 21, 22 days, and this occurs at around 11th day of the periods. So this is classic, and the Germans have a term for it. It's called Mittelschmerz, middle periods. So this patient, a separate patient, presents with irregular painful periods, has lost significant amount of weight, now presents with a steady lower abdominal pain for the past three weeks, progressively getting worse. She's tender over the lower abdomen, more on the right. Examination reveals a lower abdominal indistinct lump and a lower margin cannot be felt. So you're here thinking, could this be a pelvic appendicitis? And I'll, when we do the posi separate positions of the appendix and how they present, we'll go into that. So you're thinking your differential diagnosis is, could this be an ovarian lump because the lower margin cannot be felt? Or is this a pelvic appendicitis? Internal examination doesn't uh, shows a rounded mass that can be felt in the lower abdomen. So what you have out here is uh, we, the ultrasound showed um, a rounded mass in the pelvis. And if you can see out here, you can see that what is seen out here is a uh, ovarian mass with involvement of the, just a moment, I have to get this out of frame. You see, that's the ovarian mass. You can see the ovarian mass. You can see the ovarian mass out here as well. And you can see that there's a bit of, you know, involvement of the intestine out here. So, Unfortunately, this patient could actually, with this sort of an inflammation, the patient could either have a infective TO mass, which is, you know, because of the inflammation, it's affecting the um, intestine. You actually can actually see, if you're careful, um, let me just, sorry. 
if you're careful, you can also see that there's a sort of a squiggly blood vessel going down. So the, the condition has generated blood vessels, you know, has generated uh, extra vascularity. So this is unfortunate because this could either be an infection, could be a tumor. And for, for what, what it's worth, you do a CA-125. If it's hugely high, then the thing goes in favor of a ovarian cancer. But it can be marginal high even with an infection with a bit of ascites. So think about it. An appendix can present in myriads, you know, an appendicitis can have a myriads amount of differential diagnosis. So please remember that history and clinical examination is vital. So now if you took a talk about acute appendicitis, you have an acute catarrhal, non-obstructive appendicitis, an acute obstructive appendicitis. A fecalit or a lymphoid hyperplasia often causes an obstruction to the lumen, leading to bacterial translocation. Edema and distension causes venous obstruction, ischemia, and gangrene. Perforation may follow. The sequence of pain is epigastrium, epigastric pain or around the umbilicus, which is midline. As I said, when the inflammation is visceral, it is located inside the appendix. When you have a distension of the appendix, the pain refers to its original source. The uh, original source is the midline because of all the intestines started off in the midline and then folded to accommodate itself inside the abdominal, the cilium, uh, the uh, the uh, the cavity of the peritoneum. It just folds to uh, uh, position itself. But the essence is that the all intestine started in the middle. So you had an epigastrium or pain around the mamelicus. It migrates to the right iliac fossa. The pain may reduce, as I said, due to reactionary fluid collection. It's peritoneum pouring out fluid. So you might have a slight reduction in pain. And then you have pain and features of localized peritonitis. The localized peritonitis can become generalized due to free perforation of the appendix and there after resuscitation, the patient needs urgent surgery. Or it can become localized by the surrounding omentum and intestine adhering to the appendix and the cecum. So you have what is formed is an appendicular phlegmon or an appendicular lump. So the localized infection may form an appendicular lump, usually occurs in four to five days. Normally, it usually resolves with IV antibiotics. And you plan for an interval appendicectomy at four to six weeks. But sometimes, life is sometimes difficult. It forms a localized abscess and you have then an appendicular abscess. Now, if you have an appendicular abscess, what do you do? So here we have a young man of 26 years complained of pain some seven days ago as, you know, epigastric pain located to the right side was treated with, you know, alternative medicine. Now presents with spiking hectic temperature, which means the spike temperature spikes and it actually hits the, hits the normal line and then goes up again. He looks toxic. His pulse is 92 per minute. Blood pressure is 90 by 60. He's dehydrated. Have sunken eyes, he, um, his pulse is thready, and blood pressure is, as I said, you know, 90 by 60. He's tender over the lower right abdomen with an indistinct mass in the right lower quadrant. And then you think of an abscess. So if you do an ultrasound, this is the time that an ultrasound might help. The ultrasound shows the presence of an abscess. The problem is, you know, some of the things are eco-opaque. Now let's... What is eco-opaque? You have the cecum. That's the ileum coming in. You have the appendix which has perforated. And there's a bit of fluid all around. There's a bit of fluid all around. So what is cause, what is trying to hem it in? A, the intestine, the ileum, the terminal ileum, trying to hem it in. The other thing is that we have the abdominal policeman. What is the abdominal policeman? 
the momentum. So you have the momentum out here. Now, sometimes what happens is if the sonologist isn't very careful, gas is eco-opaque. So sometimes the abscess doesn't show up very well. But in this situation, the, uh, the abscess was defined by the radiologist very well. And you can see that this is the abscess cavity. So that's the abscess cavity. You can see that that's the abscess cavity. So what would you do? You would ask for a CT scanner of the lower abdomen. And by all means, we went ahead and go. But see, how would you follow this patient up? Day one, the patient had a pulse of 100, a blood pressure of 90 by 60, and a total leukocyte count of 14,600. Day two, a pulse of 106, blood pressure 90 by 60, a total leukocyte count of 16,000. Day three, a pulse of 116, blood pressure, we see the blood pressure is gradually going down and the total leukocyte count is going up. So what would you do? Clinically, What? how would you keep a tab on this patient? It's a very old technique and I strongly commend it to you. Um, I have done it during my residency. I'm sure Dr. Sinha has done it. What you were expected to do is take a marker and mark out the size of the lump and then put in a date. Usually what happens is you'll find that the size of the lump is increasing as the days goes on. You know, next day you come in, it's slightly larger. Clinical techniques, you know, that is day that is day one and this is day two. You come back the next day and the lump is even larger. So that is day three. Can we have the mics off, please? Day three. So you know that the appendicular lump, the abscess is increasing in size. So it's not settling down. And then this is the sort of situation where we would actually consciously ask for other investigations. In other words, you would ask for a CT scan. Now, if you have a look at the CT scan, as I said, this is an axial cut through the lower abdomen. Chaps, can you just uh, mute your connections, please? Yeah, thanks. So, again, if you're given a CT scan, you must be able to say this is an axial view through the lower abdomen. Why the lower abdomen? Because I can see the iliac bones out here. Sorry. I can see the iliac bones out here. Let's see iliac bones. Is this contrast? And that is the sacrum. You can see that that is the sacrum. That's the iliac bone. These are the, I, so if you're given a CT scan, please go through the process of describing it. This is an axial view through the lower abdomen. I can see the gluteal muscles. That's the gluteal muscles. I can see two areas where um, dye has picked up. So likely chance that and that are the right external and internal iliac vessel, uh, arteries, left external, left internal iliac arteries. What you see then is a hypodense area out here in the right iliac fossa, which is that. And we'll wipe that off so that you can see it well. And you can see that there is a collection out here that's an abscess in an appendicular abscess. Now, this is the sort of appendicular abscess that would normally settle down 
with antibiotics, if it hasn't settled down, then you have to plan for some sort of treatment. And what is the treatment that you would plan for? The treatment that you would then plan for is drainage. You either drain it or aspirate it to dry, dryness by the interventional radiologist. You may go in for an operative drainage if the interventional radiologist hasn't been able to drain it, if there are multiple collections. So if what do you mean by multiple collections? If let's say instead of having one collection out here, you land up having multiple. So you can see that it's beginning to show multiple. That is one cavity. That's the other cavity you might actually have a little cavity out here. So multiple cavities means that you have to consider, you might have to consider an operation. So operative drainage, where you would actually go, the, I mean the principle of treatment is drainage and only drainage, you're not here to carry out an appendicectomy. And this is asked in an examination, if you are operating, if you're going in for draining an operative drainage of an appendix, appendicular abscess, will you do a appendicectomy? Only and only if there's a handshake appendix, which means that you have an appendix lying completely um, free inside that uh, abscess cavity. In other words, you have an abscess cavity out here. Let's suppose you have an abscess cavity and you have the appendix completely inside and it's ruptured and it's there. So this is the sort of situation where you would consider doing an appendicectomy. So that is called a handshake appendix, which means essentially you can shake hands with the appendix. Usual traditional treatment is that you plan for an interval appendicectomy after the lump has completely disappeared. So that's the thing. So diagnosis of acute appendicitis, and you can well imagine that this was the, one of the first clinical conditions described in surgery. So plenty of clinical symptoms and signs. So we've been through a huge amount of clinical symptoms and signs and the differential diagnosis. Blood tests show a high total leukocyte count with neutrophilia, a high CRP, a normal CRP has a negative predictive value of 97 to 100%. Sensitivity is about 95%. You need to do a urinalysis, urinalysis because sometimes you have an infection, a pyanephrosis, and that mimics um, an appendicitis. Ultrasound scan to exclude other diseases, a CCT scan which has a sensitivity of 98.5% and a specificity of 98%. And before the advent of CCT scan, when we were in surgery, when we started life, there was a role of a barium meal of the ileocecal region. And principally what that told you was whether there was any problem in the ileum. And if the appendix was visualized, it was very difficult to justify a diagnosis of appendicitis. We've got some x-rays and I'll come to that later. So this is a patient of an uh, pain who presented with severe pain in the right uh, lower right abdomen. And you can see that this is again a CT scan through the lower abdomen. And what do you see out here? When you have a look at that, CT scan. Again, you, you define the normal things first. You define the ileum out here, iliac bones. I can see possibly that is the um, L5 vertebra. I can see muscles. I can see the gluteus. By the time the examiner is, so tell me what is the diagnosis. You say, sir, I can actually see, you can see that this is normal bowel. Okay, thin walled. The moment you come in to the right iliac fossa, however, you now see that there's a thickening of the wall. Can you see that thickened wall? The posterior wall is thickened. And you also have something lying outside that. that. So that is a thickened appendix. And you have inflammation out here as well. That's possibly 
information along the meso appendix. So you have the cecum out here with the posterior wall thickened. Posterior wall, you can see that the posterior wall is thickened, anterior wall is thin, and you have a thickened uh, structure just below. Now, just be a bit cautious when if this is the patient who presents at a certain amount of age, you know, after usually appendicitis is a disease of the young. If you have an elderly patient coming in with that, just be a bit cautious. Sometimes you have pathologies in the um, intestine in the cecum that actually mimics or actually uh, precipitates appendicitis and we've got some more pictures out here. Now this is a patient who came to me, young patient, so came to me with recurrent um, you know appendicitis, attacks of appendicitis and I got slightly worried. The moment you now you see that that's a coronal section and if you see the coronal section You see, that is, let me just choose that white color. See, that is the cecum. You see the cecal wall is thickened. So that's the cecum, that's the ileum. Can you see the ileum out here? That's the ileum draining in. Well, what is worrying is, if you go higher, believe me, his presentation was a classic presentation of right iliac fossa pain. But he had something else. He had that. He had this in the portion of the hepatic flexure. And that was an irregular. You can see that irregular narrowing. So unfortunately, this was a hepatic flexure lesion, a cancer of the hepatic flexure, which presented with um, features of appendicitis. So you had uh, this patient presenting with um, uh, carcinoma of the hepatic flexure presenting as, uh, as appendicitis. So you need to be cautious, you know, because this patient was, or was freshly a graduate, um, you know, he was around 29, 30 years old. So I thought this was appendicitis, but when he came in with the second attack, uh, very soon after I had discharged him from an appendicular, supposed appendicular lump, he come, came in again with another attack. And by the time I got the CT scan, it was about three weeks later. And then uh, the second attack showed this, uh, that he actually had a, a hepatic flexure mass. Right. Now, this is another patient who, uh, I mean, I'm presenting all these things because you know, just to make sure that this gentleman was around 50 years old. So to start off with, we were very cautious. If you look at him, you'll notice that if I show you one of the plates, I'm going to show you that plate. And if you see that plate, this is a CT scan through an axial cut through the upper abdomen. And that is the way you're going to approach this with oral and IV contrast, because why? Because um, you see the, uh, okay, you see dye in the aorta. Remember, aorta is always on the patient's left. So that is the aorta. The IVC is always on the patient's right. So that is the IVC. Not only that, you notice that you notice that the kidneys are also opacified. So it is a contrast, if, despite the fact, you know, obviously the easiest is that that says the radiologist has been very kind to show, tell you that it's an oral and IV contrast. But you see, it, you can see that. So this is an axial plate through the upper abdomen because I can see both kidneys. I can see the IVC. I can see the aorta. And I can see this. That is the liver. That is the liver. But look at that part. That is the normal colon. If you come in out here, again, you can see that that colon is irregularly thickened. Can you see that? It's thickened out here. It's irregularly thickened. 
So this patient again has a lesion of the hepatic flexure. See, this is how and that patient completely presented with pain in the right side, you know, uh, pain which started off in the epigastrium or around the umbilicus, then migrated to the right side. So that was it. Now I want you, this is an exercise. I want you to tell me, this is the same patient. So that was his previous plate. This was the plate through the mid abdomen. Okay, we've gone, we've shown you plenty of CT scans through the upper abdomen. Now I want you to tell me what are these structures. Now anyone, tell me what is number one. One. Kidney, sir. Yeah, kidney. so that is kidney. This is right. And two is? Left kidney. Left, Left kidney. kidney, right. What is three? So us. So us. Okay, so us. very good. So us. What is, hang on, let me get that blue color. What is four? IVC. IVC. Oh, right, as I said, IVC. And that is five is? Okay. Okay. Now, before we go to six, before we go to six, okay, I want you to tell me, all of you, I'm going to show you something. What is this structure? This structure. I'll show you that and then let me wipe it off. So what is that? Pancreas? No. It is die inside. You're very close. Well done. But think about it. Your see, it has little. Uh, let me just take a black color. You can see little folds out here, isn't it? Portal vein. No, it folds. Duodenum. Very looks very like this. Duodenum. Duodenum. Very good. It's the second and the third part of the duodenum. Well done. That's wonderful. Because remember that part of the duodenum actually lies on the great vessels. Okay. Very good. So six is a continuation of that. So six is possibly the, the third and fourth part of duodenum. Yeah, that's the third and fourth. So this is likely to be the jejunum, isn't it? Okay. Okay. Seven. See, these are what you would in an intestinal obstruction call concertina effect. Okay. The valvuli conniventis. Okay. Yes. Look at seven. That's a portion of the intestine. That's oral contrast. And it's characteristically characterless. Mm -hmm. So that is the ileum. 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 Very good. Seven. Okay. Well, where's eight? Eight is here. What is eight? Oblique, sir. Eight? Only oblique. That is the external. external that is the transverse. internal and that is the transversus. Very good. Okay, great. Well done. So eight is that. Nine is what? Rectus abdominis. Rectus abdominis. Well done. Ten. Ten. Very good. Excellent. Latissimus dorsi. Wonderful. Because that is the structure that is lying outside the casing of the abdomen. So it is latissimus dorsi. Because it's mid-abdomen, it's latissimus dorsi. Higher you would get the trapezius. Okay? Just remember that. What is 11? Quadratus lumborum. Very good. Wonderful. Very good. You people are very good. It's quadratus lumborum. 12. What is 12? Erectus spiny. Erectus spiny. Very good. Erectus spiny. Well done. That's wonderful. And what now is 13? Liver, sir. Sorry? Nee? Nee. No. Nee. Not on the right side. No, no. Nee. For that, can I just show you the previous? Hang on. Let me just show you the previous. That That was the previous one. Okay. Liver. 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 Okay. So it, it comes in a com combination. Now, if you have a look, see that showed an irregular colon. Okay. This showed a loaded colon. Okay. That colon is loaded. So possibly the hepatic flexure, there's a hepatic flexure mass, which is causing slight amount of obstruction as a result of which you have a loaded colon. Not only do you have a loaded colon, See what you also have out here. Just beside that, 
just beside that you have a small little lesion out here a small tubular lesion so if you follow that up that's a tubular lesion that's the that's the cecum and that is actually the appendix okay remember my radiologist actually was very kind enough to diagnose that you know i missed it initially but now if well, since i've got the the my drawings all out you see that that is one wall that is the wall of the cecum and that is the appendix okay i have a query yeah sure go ahead so if 13 yes. number is the lower edge of the hip, uh, liver yeah then aren't we seeing the right inferior uh, this thing uh, right hepatic uh, quadrant like uh, no sometimes you mm -hmm. have something called a renal slope isn't it what happens in a renal slope the renal slope what happens is you have the liver sometimes extending down okay that part and that part is very close to the lower part of this can be quite low particularly if you have an appendix which is retrocecal okay get it yes sir thank you the, now it fit, fills in if you've taken a section from there you're absolutely right in raising that query and we have some uh, interesting slides to show you that that's the renal slope that's the appendix okay so renal slope appendix cecum okay that falls into place now yeah thank okay. you sir so so the treatment for him was unfortunately not an appendicectomy we treated him with uh, you can see that that's the appendix which we've dragged down from uh, down below that's quite a distended appendix so remember that the tumor was there and the appendix was swollen as a result of which he presented with features of appendicitis you know so remember that this is why an appendicitis is such a critical examination a critical subject okay sometimes you have a ccd can have other diseases i'm showing you these plates because this patient also presented with a sausage shaped lump so what do you think is being shown that and that one of the commonest thing and i initially thought that that was the appendix this is in the appendix that is actually oh, hang on sorry that was in the appendix that was actually that was actually the ileum terminal ileum so what do you think is out here what what do you think we are showing out here that and that if you saw this plate end on you know if the cut was somehow this way uh, let me take another plate if the cut was this way what you would have seen was this would have been this that with something inside target good Inter that is a target sign so i just wanted to tell you that sometimes interception it's not always a target sign you get pictures like this also okay now can you see that that is actually the interceptum going in can you see that and this is the intercecipiens on the on the outside get it right so again ct scan an ultrasound showed a large sol in the lower abdomen this was actually a, a, a large ovarian cyst which twisted on itself and you can see that twist you saw that whirlpool sign okay this is a whirlpool can you see that whirlpool sign the generation of the whirlpool sign the whirlpool sign was generated because of this twist out here okay we've deflated the uh, ovary as uh, the the fluid has been taken out so this was a clear serous uh, cyst of the right ovary and 
um, there was a twist and the patient presented with features of pain in the right iliac fossa. Okay. This was one of the classic barrier meals which we used to uh, subscribe to when we were young. You see, the problem out here was that, think about it, this was the cecum. This is the cecum. You've got the appendix out here. It's a very long appendix. And, you know, hosts of people have had their appendixes taken out because it was long. But think about it. This patient had a oral, a barium meal, not even a barium enema. And guess what? That barium actually filtered all the way through into the tip of the appendix. So there can't be a blockage. See, the, the dye actually reaches all the way through to the end. So, I mean, if you are completely honest with yourself, any dye which you fed orally, if it reaches till the tip of the appendix, that appendix isn't likely to be obstructed, whatever happens. So one of the dictums we used to be told is, and be very careful, it's a long appendix, which a bit of fecolate, etc., in there. So it's not obstructed. So it could be, uh, you know, it can't be a source of major severe abdominal pain. It could be a light abdominal. This is the sort of catarrhal uh, appendicitis. And we used to be taught something called a subacute appendicitis, you know, which has been given up. It's now acute catarrhal, catarrhal uh, appendicitis. So you have inflammation occurring recurrent and you have sometimes a bit of pain over this appendix, but it can't be completely obstructed, which is why that has largely become obsolete over the years with the advent of better investigation. So what do we have as a scoring? We use something called the Alvarado score. And what is the Alvarado score? It's a migration of pain, pain which started in the epigastrum or the umbilicus, then localized in the right anic fossa, anorexia, nausea, tenderness in the right lower quadrant, rebound pain, elevated temperature, you had leukocytosis and a shift of the WBC count to the left. So that gives you a, a total of 10 of which tenderness in the right lower quadrant and an elevated uh, what, uh, TLC, total leukocyte count were the most important in terms of weightage. So that gives you a total of 10. And we had a mnemonic for people to remember, and that's called mantrels. So M for migration of pain, A for anorexia, N for nausea, T for tenderness in the right lower quadrant, R for rebound pain, E for elevated temperature, L for leukocytosis, S for WBC shift to the left. Okay, so if you had one to four, you could pat the patient on the back and discharge telling him or her to come back if the pain increases. Five to six, observation after ad and admission and observation. Seven to 10, you had to proceed on for surgery. So that was the Alvarado score, which has been evolved to help diagnosing appendix. So science um, is... One more thing, may I come in, sir? Yeah, okay. sure, please. Just a minute. So regarding the, can I go to the Alvarado score one, sir? Yeah, yeah, sure. Of course you can. Just a sec. Hang on a sec. Let me just get... get so just a word back. over there. Yeah. Is that remember this migratory of pain? Don't just say right iliac pain, okay? So the no. that migration is a more important word in the migratory pain. Second thing is that in the second slide which Sir has shown in five and six in which you have to observation, normally what is expected of you is that you would require one more investigation to stamp it. Yes. Now the chance of observation is very less, so they prefer a CT scan at that time too. So you would require one, since it's equivocal findings, yeah. and do a CT scan, you confirm it, and then you move on. So here is where you would ask for a, this is the place where you are for a CCT. Absolutely yes. right. One, one to four, you don't do a CCT. You can just pat it back. But five, six, you have to go for a second investigation to confirm. I mean, this onwards, you would actually opt for a CCT, both for this and for that, I think. Isn't it, Rudrajit? So nowadays, uh, uh, 7 to 10, normally in the books is required that is not required. CT is not required. But in yeah. practice, they do it. Because you have to yeah. confirm it uh, through a radiology for uh, medical legal. Uh, for medical legal. I mean, this, I mean uh, out here, uh, otherwise you do actually, the dictum is that you don't need to do a CCT scan. Where you need to do a CCT scan, as Rudrajit quite rightly po pointed out, was in observation and admission. 
So probably your question in the examination is going to come exactly like that. When you are writing that FOSA pain, what will you do? Uh, you would say that I will do for Alberto score and 1 to 4, I will not do anything. Uh, 5 to 6, it is there. I will go for a CT scan and 7 to 10, it becomes a clinical diagnosis anyways. So I'll have to go for an operation. Operation, yeah. Now, because you have too much of peritonitis, whatever be yeah. the cause, yes. Sure, thank you. Support. Uh, Ramanuj, are you around? I mean, do you have any other comments? I thought I saw Ramanuj coming in. Please. Okay, right, Sanjay. Hello. Yeah. Yeah. So absolutely not. Please continue. I'm okay. really interested. So, okay, please. What are the signs associated with acute metastasis? You sometimes have tenderness over the McBurney's point, which is one third of the way up between the spinal umbilical line. Remember that there's another equivalent, just the same, a mirror image point on the left side. And this left-sided point is called the colonic point. Now, I'm sorry, chaps, you know, appendicitis is one of those things which has, you know, because it's been around for ages, people have lent their names. And this is a very uh, exotic name. But just remember the colonic point. You know, uh, if somebody is feeling very adventurous, they could ask you what is a colonic point. And it, there's a gentleman called Sir Philip, Manson Bar, who uh, described that, you know, uh, so it's ridiculous, but if, uh, you won't be criticized for not remembering that name, Sir Philip Manson Bar. So that was his, his point. People had a heyday during uh, with appendicitis. So hyperesthesia of a Sharon's triangle. This was a triangle which was formed by drawing a line between the umbilicus, the anterior superior leg spine, and the symphysis pubis. Hyperesthesia of the Sharon's triangle importance was if the hyperesthesia dis disappeared, it meant that there was a perforation. So it was the pre-perforation stage where the body was trying to react, trying to locate and localize the infection that you actually had hyperesthesia over this point. So the, just remember that there was hyperesthesia over the Sharon's triangle. The importance is disappearance of hyperesthesia was important, which meant that now the patient had perforation. Rovzing sign. And Rovzing sign was important because you pressed on the left side. And when you pressed on the left side, gas shifted to the right, impinged on an inflamed appendix. And while you were pressing on the left side, the pain complained of the patient complained of tenderness on the right uh, pain on the right side. So that was Rovzing sign, and that's one of the eponymous signs that everybody has to remember. Now remember that positions of the appendix and its relevant signs. You had we actually have 74% retrocecal appendix, a pelvic of 21. We had paracecal 2, sub I subsecal 1.5%. Pre-ileal was 1% and post-ileal 1%. So how did that position affect signs and symptoms? Let us find out. Pre-ileal and post-ileal often present with diarrhea. Signs pass with post-ileal appendicitis because it, you had the ileum lying in front. But because it was irritating the intestine, the small intestine, you sometimes the patient present with diarrhea. Now the other person other group of patients who present with have appendicitis and present with diarrhea is two others. You have a pelvic which irritates the rectum and also children sometimes present with diarrhea. The other presentation is, and unfortunately that's something that hasn't been you know, talked about, one of the causes of constipation, you know, patient has pain and the patient doesn't pass stool. That's also appendicitis. Retrocecal, abdominal signs are often very sparse with tenderness or rigidity in the right flank or more posteriorly. And because the ureter, the line of the ureter laid dead, you could have ureteric inflammation that can cause hematuria. Okay? Right. Now, to understand the other signs, I'm going to show you two muscles. That's the psoas and that's the iliacus that gets inserted out here. So the movement is flexion. You also have the obturator internus going behind and 
inserting into the neck of the femur and the action therefore was external rotation. So now if we put in the, the, the picture with the position, if you had a retrocecal appendix that actually irritated the iliosoas and because it was irritation of the iliosoas, it caused irritation and spasm of the right iliosoas muscle leading to the psoas sign, pain on extension of the right hip. Okay, so that's the classic source sign. So you need to, these are the eponymous signs that you have to remember. You have to remember the Rofsiv sign. You have to remember the source sign. And if it was pelvic, see if the pelvic appendix sometimes irritated the obturator internus. So if you flex the hip and try to do an internal rotation, patient complaint of pain. And that was called the COPES obturator internus, internus, obturator internus sign. So that was Sir Zachary Cope, another surgeon of note who lent his name to uh, the sign because of the irritation of the obturator internus. In addition, you had something else. What do you have? In a pelvic appendix, you had the rectum and the anal canal lying behind. So pelvic may also present with diarrhea, and with this thing called tenesmus. What is tenesmus? Painful, ineffective straining to pass stool. Okay. In addition, you had something else lying in front and that was the bladder. So because the bladder was there, you had something called strangury. What is strangury? Ineffective straining at passing urine. So remember that the pelvic appendix can present with diarrhea can also present with tenesmus and can present with strangury because of its position lying close to the anal canal and rectum and close to the bladder. Right, so operations for an appendix. The classic operation is called the gridiron incision where you put an incision at the McBurney's point. Um, but there's one thing that you need to do before you start an operation. You feel for an appendicular lump before starting the operation after the patient is under anesthesia. Some of these patients have a lot of muscle guard and rigidity. And if you can feel an appendicular lump, the dictum is please truncate, stop the operation and come away. Treat this patient conservatively. Wait for uh, the lump to settle down and go in for an interval appendicectomy. Why? Because if the patient has formed a lump, it means that the intestine and the omentum is completely stuck on top of the appendix. This was the appendix and you have the intestine, the omentum and the cecum completely stuck out here to form a mass. So the worst thing you could do is try and dig in out here and try and take the appendix out a sure way of trying giving the patient a fecal fistula. So if there's no lump, you put an incision in the, um, at the McBurney's point, the external oblique is cut in the same line. What is done is you having cut the external oblique in the same line, you split the transversus and the uh, internal oblique. The peritoneum is picked up by two mosquito forceps, felt and cut when it's felt to be safe. The peritoneal incision is extended. The cecum with the appendix is delivered into the wound. So now you need to take the artery and vein. The artery and vein is taken by usually passing a right angle forceps. The way we do it is to pass the forceps around out here and tie it off which leaves the appendix without any blood supply. The appendix stump is crushed with a mosquito forceps and I'll show you pictures, transfixed and cut. Some people go in for an invagination, some people don't. The terminal ileum has to be traced to exclude a Meckel's diverticulum. So if you now take that picture, so the idea is you take pass in a right angle and you take the uh, uh, you take the uh, uh, suture throughout here. In the days of old, we used to use silk. Now we have other uh, material like vicryl. You tie it off. 
that leaves the appendix without any blood supply and you, then you uh, uh, you hang on I forgot this again you then crush the base of the appendix with a mosquito forceps nothing more you transfix it out there cut it and remove the appendix what do you do with the stump is either you invaginate or you leave it uh, you um, leave it open but you don't leave it completely open you uh, bring in a portion of um, fat all around and then tie it over so so this was from mango you see this is the blood supply being taken having taken that it's crushed this is the tie for the appendicular artery this is the tie for the um, uh, appendix so here the invagination is carried out now this is something described in mango which i would strongly advise against you know mango suggests that once you've invaginated you you tie the invaginated strings the sutures to the pen to the one that you've tied off the appendicular artery and that has often led to catastrophes by pulling it out and the appendicular artery if it starts to bleed it slips under the mesentery and then you're in a major 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 soup so i would strongly advise you not to do that uh, step so the other option is that in when you are not going to do an invagination you have the fold of trees out here and you can easily pull that up and suture don't bring the appendicular artery stump and soup and stitch it on top that's the worst thing you can do because as i said if it slips it it slips below the mesentery and then you've got a major problem on your hand closure you pick up the peritoneum and you close it with a purse string now this is a step which is usually not with this hasn't been described in mango but you know the idea is if you split the muscle you just let the muscle and it slips back i have found it always better to put in, put in very light stitches that stitch these sutures cannot constrict you shouldn't strangulate the muscle so that's the whole purpose of this exercise approximate do not cause strang uh, strangulation so close the both the transversus and the internal oblique and then you close the external oblique now laparoscopic you can do it the important thing is to define the meso appendix but there's an important difference when you cut the meso appendix you cut it close to the appendix remember what we did when we were doing laparoscope uh, open was we were tying it out here there's a reason for that the two reasons for that a the vessels are thinner out here and you can see that we are using a harmonic scalpel so we need something that can coagulate and it's better to coagulate smaller vessels than large but there's another important reason and that's going to become pretty obvious so that is the appendix and what you do is you try and find out whether you reach the base see you can actually see the tenia so if you proceed out here you can actually sometimes damage the cecum and that's something that you wouldn't like to do so i'm using a preformed endo loop but you can of course use one of the knots and i think we have rudrajit who's the expert in uh, laparoscopic and he'll tell you it's called the roder's knot uh, with some modifications also so i prefer tying the first uh throw the end loop lightly not very tight the reason is i don't want that area to slough out so that's the first and when you notice that we when we put in the second it's far 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 tighter okay so you can see that it's blanching now see now the important thing is this is the reason that we cut the meso appendix and laparoscopic close to the appendix that after having cut it when you're trying to extricate it you would prefer you know that end is open that you would prefer dragging it out through an endo loop um a, a, to a tubular uh, tube um uh, tube reducer rather than uh, cause contamination of the ports so here you finish the operation by looking for the appendix and of course the uterus and the right adnexa now that's 
a subsequent appendix. But sometimes, unfortunately, you have a retrocecal appendix and it's sometimes very difficult. You follow the tenia to trace the appendix. So you can see that the appendix is coming up, it's retrocecal. And if you've got inflammation, you've noticed that I've drawn a bit out here, you have some adhesions on the side. And unless you cut them, you cannot approach that appendix. It's almost like mobilizing it for a right hemicolectomy. So we are choosing to avoid that area. It felt a bit, bit, I purposely showed you that because having done that, we realized that there was a bit of thickening. It wasn't really transparent. So you cut those fibers. These are the fibers that we are cutting right now to mobilize the appendix uh, and the ascending colon. So that don't forget that that is the commonest position of the appendix. So And you can see, um, you know, I was asked a question, why was that close to the liver? You will see why it's close to the liver now, because some of these things, some of the retrocecal appendix, and that's the commonest position of the appendix, can be, you can see the liver out, out there on the side, out here. You can see the liver. So it can be a difficult dissection, but I mean, as a matter of fact, there's a Chinese uh, trial which said that if you find a retrocecal append bad appendix at open surgery, you close it up and do it laparoscopically. But you know, that's just a paper. So we are dissecting out the retrocecal appendix and be cutting only when you find that the it's completely see. We use a, the suction tube as a beautiful dissector. And now we've got a bit of a transparent area which we which we can cut. The harmonic has two blades. One is the insulator. The white one is the insulated. So I'm keeping that towards the intestine. So you see, you need to get the entire tip out. Here is where one of the tricks, tricks is that you might choose to do it retro retrograde appendicectomy, which means you take it at the base and you, then you dissect out the entire um, appendix um, from below upwards. I mean, you take take the base first, and then you cut cut the rest out. Um, so it's, you can do it open and uh, at laparoscopy. Both procedures are are there. So you see that is the appendix, the tip of the appendix. And you can see that the liver is just beside out here. So that why that was why on that CT scan that was very close. Okay. Now one of the issues is that you have to remember a difficult appendix is a difficult operation, both at laparoscopy or at open appendicectomy. Now I'm going to tell you that is my abdomen. And I, I know that this is a retrocecal appendix and this is why you need to be able to assess and tell us why this um, uh, you know why and how um uh, you can ap approach so you can actually have you have a you had a lump which has settled down and you think this is a retrocecal appendix so you have some options you can have an option of going in for a right paramedian incision now if can you tell me the steps of a paramedian incision how would you go about doing a paramedian incision we have, the patient is on the table We've prepped the patient. We've put in an incision here. Now, what is the next thing that you find? The next thing you find is the shining anterior rectus sheath, isn't it? So if you have an anterior rectus sheath, you put an incision out here, as we've done out there. So next, what do you do? You open it up. You find plenty of something called tendinous in intersections. Now, tendinous intersections are, you know, the things that give you that six to eight pack abdomen. Salman Khan, remember Salman Khan and others, John Abraham, 
they have tenderness in sections. So effectively, what you then do is you try and dissect this way. Why do we dissect this way? Don't forget that the nerves of the rectus abdominis come in through from the lateral side. So you dissect out this way. Now, having dissected out this way, you remember that that is the encasement that is the muscle now the important thing to realize is tenderness intersections only are only are anterior there are no tenderness intersections nothing down below okay remember there's nothing down below so you actually cut it coming out here you retract the rectus out there and you cut the posterior uh, rectus sheet out there and then you go in and do a appendicectomy okay now the problem is sometimes you you put in either a macburney incision or the very nice and cosmetic lens incision the lens incision is spelled l a n z l a n Z, the lands incision. So, what we'll do is we'll put in a lands incision. We've put in a lands incision. We split the muscle. Now we discover that this patient has a high up retrocecal appendix. Now, what are you going to do? Now, what we normally tell, tell people is that you should learn how to do a muscle cutting, but see what the problem is. You split up till here. Now you've done a muscle cutting there, which meant means that that is raw end of muscle and that is not. So the problem is you finish the operation when you come out, how do you close it up? This is the issue. See, you need to make sure that when you put in bites out here, you do not strangulate the muscle. So you have to be careful of the bites that you put in. And it's preferable that you always put in interrupted sutures out here put in interrupted bites at different levels, not at the same, making sure that you don't strangulate. And sometimes, sometimes we actually use box bites and that is sometimes can strangulate, you know, if you're putting in box bites. That has to be closed. And then you put in small bites like you did for the split. Now, the problem is sometimes that leaves an area out here where hernias can occur. So remember that one of the, the problems of doing a muscle cutting incision is just that. Right. Now, appendix, as I said, has been there for a long time. You want eponymous names? I can give you a, a hundred eponymous names. Plus, I would recommend that you remember the ones that you definitely need to remember are the Rousing sign. So hang on. So you remember the Rousing sign out here. Remember the Cope's obturators test. Cope's actually also some people say that he discovered, described the Cope's source test. But um, across in Europe, people are very upset because they think this Russian surgeon called Vincent Obratsova described this first. So just remember that that's a problem. People sometimes uh, do it. But you, what you definitely, definitely need to remember is McBurney's point. If you can remember the others, God bless you. I don't think, for me, I think it's uh, enough for me to know the four. That is the cope source cope test, the cope obturator test. Remember the rousing signs and remember the, the uh, McBurney's point. Right. So I think, uh, Rudrajit and Ramanuj, any other questions? I think, you know. If you do, I have an OSCE. We are starting this nowadays. Um, we will end with an OSCE. So two pelvic conditions, your choice, which may mimic appendicitis are, and you can reply in the chat. Rudrajit, all right for them to reply on the chat? Yes, uh, please reply in the chat. You have uh, five minutes. I yep. think that is enough for this. Yes, absolutely enough for this. So, you just do five minutes and after that, we're going to give you the answer. This is a practice for all of you. So. 
Actually, five minutes is a very long period of time for this. No, for us, I think when we were in the <laughs> under the hammer, then five minutes is very small. <laughs> Quite right. Depends on which side of the table you are there. Exactly. For us, it is like interminable. So I need the somebody answering num question number two as well. So, Rudrit, you keep a tab. I don't have a watch. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, two minutes are up. Two and a okay. half minutes are up. Okay. Okay, last one minute. Okay. Ten seconds. <laughs> you remind me okay. of Master Chef. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, Master Chef. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, so now go on with the answers. I think they're all. Seconds. Yeah, I think I think I think they were absolutely right. But I mean, if you remember that this young girl came in with, you know, she missed, didn't have a perfect period in the last one. Uh, and uh, this time, you know, had a very sp small amount of uh, period flow during the last periods and she's due for a last period. So I would keep ectopic pregnancy high on my list of pelvic conditions. You're absolutely right. And I would also keep a torsion of the ovarian cyst, but I'll grant you, you can use any two, but of if you ask me, I would have put ectopic, uh, a ruptured ectopic and a torsion uh, uh, of an ovarian cyst fairly high up. Symptoms and okay. signs which... Yes. I'll just, I'll just, go, I'll just, I'll yeah. just, uh, I'll yeah, just say ahead. something about the question number yeah. one. This is a yeah. question number one. Please note, people have answered ectopic and torsion is very right because he has said two pelvic conditions, not RIF conditions. Okay. So the pelvic thing is very important over here. 
which are the pelvic organs and from which the pain might come. So that just a little bit of confusion that you might be having. So, next so people who have said right ureteric colic and for people who said deflitis, just remember, I mean, that was the important thing. In an OSCE, they ask for, you know, they are specific words. So read the question very carefully. You know, you all know it. But get into the habit for an OSCE to read the questions very carefully. So two pelvic conditions, as Rudrajit quite rightly yeah, pointed out. OSCEs are very tricky. It's simple. Mm -hmm. It's very simple, but it's tricky. So read the pelvis. In this, the trick thing will be pelvis or the righty left fossa. If it's pelvis, yeah. then it's very specific. If they're asking for two only things. Two and only two. Okay, symptoms and signs which suggest a retrocecal appendix are that the patient has a paucity of signs and symptoms and the pain actually is behind, you know, relatively high up and behind. And of course, so is this. So I think that. I think the answer, it is yeah. very, they've, asked, they've answered very variedly. So just tell me whether it's right or wrong. How much will you give for that? Uh, I think the first time was diarrhea and flank pain. Will that person get marked? Uh, no, I don't think flank pain would not be all right, but diarrhea would be something that you wouldn't associate with a retrocecal appendix, uh, then, isn't it? There is, yes, sir. And then there is diarrhea and right lower abdominal pain, cope sore sign. You getting so, marks on this? I would suggest that if you had a flank pain and you had uh, a source test, that would uh, suggest that you had a retrocecal appendix. The other thing, you, I can stretch it to a point of having hematuria, but then, you know, the incidence of hematuria for a retrocecal appendix is, I don't think, all that high. Most of them have answered diarrhea and flank pain. Yeah, I think diarrhea is more a feature of pelvic uh, uh, retrocecal, pre and post -ileal. Uh, so then what would be the answer then for this? I would think a flank pain and a psoas test would be the things that an examiner would be searching for. Okay, right. Uh, Alvarado, I think they've all got it right. Leukocytosis and shift to the left. And classic incision is a gridiron incision and a cosmetic variation is a lens incision. Ramanuj, Sorry. do you have any other comments? Ramanuj there? I don't know. I don't think he's there. Okay. Uh, sir, in this, uh, in, if a question comes, classical incision for appendicectomy is called what? For one mark. So what do we write? Gridiron. Gridiron. Okay. Isn't it? Yeah, okay. And the cosmetic variation is uh, land. Land sensation. I think all of us have got right. Yeah, I think most uh, everybody's got it right. But I think just be cautious of using diarrhea. I mean, this is the condition which doesn't present with diarrhea. A retrocecal appendix uh, very rarely presents with diarrhea. Okay. Any questions? Um, wait, I'll just check the chat. Uh, but thank okay, you, uh, Rudrajit. I think this was a good exercise to finish every uh, of our classes with an OSCE. I think this is attention. <laughs> True, but also I think it gets them uh, geared up for OSCEs because I think that's going to be the way that uh, uh, the examiner's examination is going to be. As a matter of fact, I think there's a question over there which I found out is that could you please repeat the point pain may reduce due to reactionary fluid collection? Yeah, you see what happens is you have appendicitis, and pain starts in the epigastrum around the Thank you.